<laughs> Hi, everybody. It's a great privilege to uh, open here. Um, this is, um, apart from the privilege of opening, um, it's work that Jane and I have been doing for some time on Arabana, a uh, language of Northern South Australia. Um, and for those of you who have a lot to do with Arabana, it's on the western side of Lake Eyre um, in a dialect chain going up to Wangaluru in the uh, Simpson Desert. Uh, the main uh, person that we've been working with, Sydney Strangeways, is um, Arabana proper from the southern area. Um, we've also been uh, accessing some recordings of um, Arabana, another Arabana speaker. Um, so that's where Arabana is. Um, you'll note um, that it borders immediately on Lower Aranda, so it's the southern neighbour of the Arandic languages, and then you go south into Kwiani and Adyamatna, and then down to um, south, the rest of South Australia. Um, so uh, Jane and I have had a long-standing interest in pre-stopping. Um, which is a, a quite a widespread phenomenon. Um, so if you have a two phonological forms which look pretty similar, um, what you find in large numbers of Australian languages is that the medial nasal in the first form <coughs> in phonetic realization actually has a period of oral closure. So the Veal and raising gesture is effectively delayed. It doesn't commence in the vowel, but actually commences later than the actual start of um, consonantal closure in the oral tract. Um, so you get that's a very widespread pattern and probably underreported for reasons that I'll explain later. Um, it's quite possible that you could be thinking languages you're familiar with don't have this phenomenon, but until you've actually done a great deal of detailed checking. It's not actually possible to be certain of this. Uh, but contrastingly, you'll see the second form uh, does not have pre-stopping. Uh, and as I've indicated, the reason for this is following the suggestion of Harold's originally, which Jane and I have just instrumentally verified, or to be absolutely honest, um, we got somebody who knew what they were doing and then <laughs> nodded knowledgeably at various points when they told us what they'd found. But in between two nasals, at least in synchronically Arabana, and we speak more generally in Australian languages, the vowel is fully nasalized. Uh, whereas the, so the obvious difference between one and two is that one has an initial consonant which isn't nasal, whereas two has a consonant which is nasal, which has various consequences. Okay. Um, now initial dropping, initial dropping is quite a widespread and discontinuously distributed change in Australia. Um, and along with everybody else who'd ever looked at the interaction between um, initial dropping and pre-stopping, I had always assumed that essentially the order of development was that um, you have non-contrastive pre-stopping, uh, then you get initial dropping, and once you get initial dropping, you've lost the conditioning factor, and therefore you develop contrastive pre-stopping, um, which had always been my assumptions as to the order. Uh, working with Jane on Arabana, I came to realize there were problems with that. Um, and I'm going to put forward some evidence that in fact, the order of change is different. That the order of change, obviously non-contrastive pre-stopping comes initially, but contrastive pre-stopping develops before initial dropping is what I'll be uh, presenting evidence for here. Okay, so synchronic Arabana. Um, pre-stopping is contrastive in Arabana. Uh, it has a complex and quite lexicalized distribution. There's no phonological or morphological criteria on which you can predict the distribution 
of pre-stopping synchronically in Arabana. Um, there's no non-contrastive pre-stopping in Arabana. So forms that would potentially historically have shown pre-stopping do not show pre-stopping synchronically in Arabana. So Pani has no alternate realization Pani synchronically in Arabana. Um, and there's significant evidence of anticipatory nasalization synchronically in Arabana. So in a form like Pani, there's considerable evidence for right edge nasalization. So overall, it's quite clear that pre-stopping is a completed sound change in Arabana and was completed before any of the speakers that we know about um, acquired Arabana. Uh, so synchronic Arabana initial dropping, there's two distinct initial dropping changes. Um, one of them is the reduction of home organic um, semi-vowel vowel sequences word initially. So there's no Y, I or W, U forms in Arabana, there's only I and U. There's a second sound change, and this is the critical one. It's very different. Um, it's a reduction of the initial velar nasal flow by R to R, and this is where R initial words in Arabana synchronically come from. It's in progress in the lexicon. Um, so it's not completed. There is still a synchronic contrast between R and Nga, a substantial synchronic contrast between R and Nga in Arabana. Um, in between, in the period that Arabana was recorded from the earliest records in the 1890s through to Louise's work, some of the lexemes changed their forms. So in accordance with the earliest records, um, yes was Narayi and Arayi, and indeed Arabana, the name is in fact reported as Narabana in the earliest sources. So this is an in progress change. And indeed, when the people we've worked with or the resources we've been using were acquiring Arabana as a first language in the late 19th, early 20th century, they were acquiring at a stage when this change was spreading through the lexicon. So clearly in Arabana, initial dropping is evidently a later change than contrastive pre-stopping. Pre-stopping had become contrastive before initial dropping started in Arabana. So the order that I had always assumed was the obvious order clearly doesn't work for Arabana. And indeed, there are some other language problems in investigating fully this hypothesis is once that you move south of Arabana, it's not possible to check data with first language speakers. And the only really reliable data we have um, at the moment, or the two sets of reliable data, certainly Kuyani, uh, which Louise recorded. Um, I've gone through the Kuyani data, and it does appear, in fact, that pre stopping is probably contrastive in Kuyani. Um, certainly, looking at those forms, it's difficult to see that you could come to any other conclusion other than that was. But you will note that Kuyani does not show any signs of initial dropping, and it does not have um, vowel initial R, uh, uh, words with initial R. It has words with initial I and U, so it has the other sound change, but not initial R. And similarly, Parangala, which is further south, which you're relying mostly on 19th century records. Um, again, from the data that's given, it appears that um, it's probably contrastive, at least in the northern dialects of Parangala. Um, Pre-stopping goes further south. It's clearly a major phenomenon in the recordings of Kana and southern varieties of foreign color. Uh, it's less, much less clear with that data exactly what's going on. But again, with foreign color, you can note that there's no evidence of initial dropping in foreign color. Um, now, in considering contrastive and non-contrastive pre-stopping, um, there's actually a significant phonetic difference between the two. Um, so in uh, the left-hand side, you have data on the duration of the stop components in pre-stopping, in non-contrastive pre-stopping. And on the right, you have data on the phonetic duration of the stop components of pre-stopping uh, in where it's contrastive. And you can see that there's a 
significant difference and it is statistically significant if you do the stats on it. It's a major difference. Um, the pre-stopping in contrastive, the stop component in contrastive pre-stopping is much longer. Um, obviously a much longer stop component is far more easily perceptible. Um, and indeed this goes back to the point I made um, earlier. Um, Non-contrastive pre-stopping, these stop components are typically fairly brief and indeed very difficult to hear. Um, the next point to note is that there's no obvious direct connection between initial dropping and this lengthening component. So if you have a form like Pudney with non-contrastive pre-stopping, we'll say averaging 25 milliseconds, you drop the initial consonant, there's no direct reason why that should in and of itself lead to a doubling of the length of the pre-stopped, uh, the stop component in pre-stopping. Um, so I've come to a very different view of the functions of contrastive pre-stopping, partly which Joan and I developed earlier. Um, this involves looking at boundary marking. So in terms of boundary marking, uh, segments themselves have greater or lesser capacities to be boundary markers. So sonorants generally are very poor boundary markers because they're marked by periodic energy throughout the spectrum. Voice obstruments are much better boundary markers because they only have periodic energy in the lowest parts of the spectrum. And voiceless obstruents are your best options because they have no periodic energy. Um, and in speech processing terms, when we think of speech processing, obviously I'm providing a general overview here. Uh, speech signals, we all know, is largely continuous. You have to somehow break it up into bounded in units of information. Pauses are the best boundary signals. Um, they're your clearest boundary signals that here's some break in the information presentation. They have either silence or background aperiodic periodic energy. Um, and for segments, basically the less periodic energy you have, the better it is as a boundary signal and stops are definitely better boundary signals than sonorants. Uh, going on with speech processing, uh, in Australian languages and probably universally, prosody is definitely central in speech processing. Uh, in Australian languages, prosodic peaks are left aligned uh, generically. Um, so if you hear the sequence in one, um, your at least default, and I'm assuming that the capital A's here are prosodic peaks and the small case A's are um, prosodically weak elements. Um, your default analysis is going to be to break it up as in two. Um, you're not going to break it up as in three into just sequences of disyllabic units or trisyllabic units or whatever. You're going to pay attention to the prosodic peaks uh, in analysing. Uh, prosodic and segmental structure correlate uh, very highly in Australian languages. There's a high frequency of stops in initial positions. Um, if you hear the sequence in one, you're likely to divide it up as in two and I should have that star, not as in three. You're the least, again, I'm talking here in quantitative probabilistic terms, not absolute terms, but your default assumption is probably two and not three if you hear a sequence like this. Um, and prosody and segmental structure will give you prosodic words in Australian languages. Um, and I should point out that a prosodic word could be either a suffix or a root. So a prosodic word does not equal a lexical morpheme. It could be a grammatical morpheme as well. Um, beyond this, once you have prosodic words, it's much more difficult to erect any kind of higher level structure. There's a great deal less consensus beyond this basic division of the speech stream. Um, so there's a great deal of debates over primary and secondary stress in Australian languages. Um, contrastive pre-stopping is generally restricted to lexical morphemes. So apart from one dialect of Arabana or Kachaka, um, it's only lexical morphemes that show pre-stopping. Um, 
So if you hear a sequence like one and it's sort of prosodic word two, which I should have highlighted, it doesn't have pre-stopping. If you heard a series like that with pre-stopping, then it's probably the case that prosodic word two there is a grammatical morpheme, a suffix of some kind. Whereas if you hear the same sequence and they all have pre-stopping, it's less probably the case that prosodic word two is a suffix. Um, this is obviously, again, probabilistic. Uh, you know, this is in part of your overall calculation metrics. Um, and basically the lengthening of the stop component in contrastive pre-stopping um, enables it to uh, function much more successfully as a boundary signal. And what it does as a boundary signal, it tells you that this prosodic word is a lexical head and not a grammatical head. Obviously, if you're doing syntax, you'll be having other views of functional heads and et cetera. Um, initial dropping, the motivations for initial dropping are complex and I'm certainly not going to cover, cover them today. Um, critically, they'll include concepts such as segment informativity um, that people like Khan Prever and so on are talked about. Um, the point that I wanted to bring up here is once you have contrastive pre-stopping is many lexical items have a good boundary signal immediately to the left of V1 and a good boundary signal immediately to the right of V1. So they've got double boundary marking. Um, and my suggestion is that essentially in the basket of factors, and these are different order, in the, there's a basket of factors that determine pre-stopping, I'm sorry, initial dropping, whether it's going to happen or not. Um, if you've got contrastive pre-stopping, you've got double boundary marking, and that favours um, initial dropping. Um, and basically my suggestion is you have non-contrastive pre-stopping, which is motivated by quite different things and not what I'm talking about today. Contrastive um, pre-stopping develops to distinguish essentially prosodic words which are lexical morphemes from prosodic words which are grammatical morphemes that assists you in breaking up the speech stream. Um, obviously it's only a certain quantitative factor, it's not going to be an absolute factor. Um, once you've developed contrastive pre-stopping, then um, that shifts the balance in the basket of factors that determine pre-initial um, dropping slightly towards a positive in more towards positive. It's more favorable that you'll get pre-initial uh, dropping if you already have contrastive pre-stopping. Now, contrastive pre-stopping and initial dropping um, vary quite significantly. So Alcon and Alcon, um, at least in the reliable data, Sommers data uh, have no consonant initial roots. They have contrastive pre-stopping um, and it's uh, gone right through the lexicon. Uh, Aranda has 75%, Kadich has 62%. Those three all have also have pre-stopping in nasal stop clusters. So you get Adanda, Atunga, et cetera, Abba. Um, in Adyamatna and Arabana, you do not get that. So pre-stopping does not develop if the nasal is in a cluster in Arabana or in Adyamatna. And indeed, any of the other languages of South Australia, none of them have pre-stop clusters. Um, and uh, I basically uh, wanted to sort of finish up uh, by talking about aerial phenomena, because I know James always had an interest in this. Um, my uh, view, uh, my argumentation is that there's been uh, a significant airflow of aerial um, patterns from Arandic in the north into South Australia. So um, non-contrastive pre-stopping, certainly there's some evidence, but certainly contrastive pre-stopping, it's much more frequent in I mean, it's, it has a wider range in Aranda. It's There's reason to think it's spread south. Similarly, initial dropping, the evidence would suggest it spreads south. And there are other sorts of things that suggest to me that Aranda and many of the languages of South, Aranda and many of the languages of South Australia um, share various aerial kinds of features. 
Um, so I'll finish up there. Um, thumbs up, so I'm clearly a very good boy. All the time. <laughs>